This is One on One. We are pleased to welcome here at Public Broadcasting Rosemarie Terenzio, the author of a book called Fairy Tale Interrupted, a memoir of life, love, and loss, and also the founder of uh, and CEO of RMT, PR Management. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. A fairy tale interrupted New York Times bestseller. Um, John F. Kennedy Jr. and Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Your connection, for those who do not know, to John F. Kennedy Jr. was? I was his um, executive assistant and then chief of staff for five years. Over at George. Over at George Magazine. Describe George for those who didn't George know. was amazing. It was the startup that was, we were all under the age of 30 working there and trying to change the way young people viewed politics and trying to make politics accessible to people who wouldn't normally um, love it. Yeah. But, and we came to love it through John's passion for it. And the magazine really embodied John. It was celebrity and politics kind of merged into one. So he understood that, you know, that connection and he understood why it was exciting to people. So he decided to make it broader and uh, had a mission. John died on July 16th, 1999. Mm -hmm. The impact of John's death on your life. Um, oh, that was quick. Um, it was absolutely devastating. Too quick, by the way? I shouldn't have asked you that. No, 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 that's fine. I mean, I was expecting it, but um, it was absolutely devastating. And I think that in terms of, not just from a career perspective, obviously, but from a personal perspective. How personal was it? Very personal. I was very close to John and to Carolyn. And, uh, Is that a nick? Looks like a nickname to me. And how, how do you know that, a nickname, nickname right away, right? I know, I know. You got good seats. Well, yes, he, he got good we seats. We were here. sitting, our feet were on the floor. And at one point, Patrick Ewing at the time waved to him. And I was like, don't tell me that was for you. And he's like, oh, shut up. I just couldn't, I was just like, this is ridiculous. You're tight. Yeah, and we it was were personal. tight. Yeah, we were. We were. I mean, I think John didn't have a lot of people in his life that had his back, and I did. And I didn't have an agenda. I just, it was just my job. And we, we had a very, um, we were comrades, you know, we were, we were buddies. Did it start out that way? No, no it, it did. I read, I read the all. book cover to cover. Not at all. <clears throat> I'm sitting there going, uh, no. No, you're born and raised? In the Bronx. Yeah. So, uh. Different background from John F. Kennedy I Jr. Mean, couldn't be more different. <laughs> Could not be more different. Yeah. And your dad was a Democrat? My dad was a staunch rep yeah, I know. Republican. Oh, a Republican. Oh my God. Oh. <laughs> so, so he said, wow, you're working for the Kennedys. That's great. No, he was like, Who, uh, why do you want to work for them? <laughs> So, um, my, yeah, my dad was not initially impressed, but he was all, but he was very proud of it and thought, you know, of course, behind my back was telling everybody that he deal. works for JFK Jr. Yeah, you know, it, it was a big deal, but I didn't realize it at the time because you're kind of in it and you're young and you're just sort of, and, you know, after six months, it's a job. You know, Is it? It, it, yeah. Wait but, a minute, I'm reading but, the book, you're getting all kinds of calls yeah, from all kinds of people, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're dealing but with at, all kinds of problems. But at, but at the same time, it's still like a job and you have to, you have to perform, you, know, you have to do your job. So I think the balance of that, but there was always, you know, moments when I was on the train on the way to work or walking down the street or, you know, just, and thinking, wow, you know, I mean, it wasn't lost on me, but it wasn't. It didn't stop me from being able to do my job. Like, no. I work for JFK Jr. Like, if every single person on this train knows who that is. You know, since no one <clears throat> watching right now, and you also had a very, <clears throat> excuse me, close relationship with Carolyn as well. Yes. Biggest misconception about John F. Kennedy Jr. was? He wasn't smart. Talk about it. He was very smart, brilliant, actually, wise. Um, emotionally intelligent, could read people in a minute, um, and had to be in a way because of who he was. I mean, he had to be able to sort of size people up, but he was a brilliant editor. He knew what worked and what didn't. He knew what people wanted to read and what they didn't. And he was able to, which takes somebody very intelligent, he was able to humble himself in a way that made other people comfortable around him. So. If you're in a room with John for more than five minutes, the 
the whole you were you were you were like oh wow he's normal he's just a regular you know he's just a, a nice guy. And the whole thing about his looks, which people yeah, I mean, made he, such a you big know, deal he about. Had such a, uh, How did he see himself? He, I mean, I think he knew. He he knew he was. <laughs> of course, you know, he knew. <laughs> good looking, but I don't think he thought he was the best looking guy in the world. I think he kind of took it all with a grain of salt, and you know, it just kind of was part of who he was. But I don't I don't think he was. Um, Fo that's not really he what he impressed. was focused on. No, you know, he had this, um, I remember him saying to a friend of his once, you know, it's really easy for me to be a great man. Everybody's, I'm set up for it. Everybody loves me, everybody loved my family, my that. dad, yeah. But I'm more, I'm more concerned about being a good man. And I think he really was. And I think he understood that having that kind of a platform, you really have to do Good things. Help people. Yeah. He wanted to yeah. help people. Oh, all the time, yeah. And by the way, uh, in the book, it was also struck, we'll talk about Carol in a second. I was struck by how he got hit up all the time for favors constantly. constantly. And your job was to manage a lot of that. Yeah, and also to understand, you know, to get to know him in a way that you knew who to, you know, present or what to present and what not to present. And, and, you know, a lot of things, you know, that would, if there were a lot of celebrities involved in something, he tended to shy away from it. He liked to do things, he liked to bring attention to things that were not going to get there on their own and that he thought were good causes. Caroline, only because it's, I mean, he had a close relationship with her and the public perception of her on the part of some. Yeah. Speaks for itself. Oh, yeah. You didn't see that. Your experience was different. You encouraged her to go on. I did. That I did. flight mm -hmm. to that wedding. Yes. Talk about it. I felt that it would be a spectacle for him and for her if she didn't show up. It was a big family wedding. Everyone was going to be there. And there, w there was that perception of her, and I didn't want her to feed into it by not showing up. Um, do I wish I hadn't told her to go? Uh, obviously. But I, I mean, I don't think it wouldn't have happened if she didn't go, I just, it's just something that'll always be, you know, here. You wrote this book. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I... And you waited. Yeah, because, well, two things. I, mostly because my mom had passed away and she was so proud of all of this and that, you know, this, her daughter, my mom didn't go to college, my dad didn't go to college, they worked two jobs. There's my mom. <laughs> they worked two jobs. They worked really hard. They put us through school. And it re I really felt like it was a tribute to my mom because it was something that Your she was mom. so proud of. Yeah. Would she tell everybody that? Oh, everyone who would listen. What'd she Every say? You know, my daughter works. You know who my daughter works for? <laughs> and she would whisper it, JFK Jr. How Italian is that? It's so Italian. <laughs> I, knew, I knew it right it's away. So she Italian. would lower her voice. Oh, yeah. I'm like, Mom, no one's going to hear you. <laughs> you have to say it. If you're going to say it, say it. Oh, boy. First of all, um, I wish I had more time with you. Yeah. And um, I want to encourage everybody to go out and get this book. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a tough question okay. on the way out. I ask uh, in interesting people like yourself uh, you. the most significant lesson they've learned about leadership because I wrote this book called Lessons in Leadership. What's the number one lesson you learned about leadership in your career, um, which may also be the number one lesson you learned about life? If you put people in, and I, and I learned this from John, if you put people in over their heads, 99% of the time they will rise to the occasion and not fail. Why? Because people want to, most people want to achieve something and feel like they're doing something more than just what they're capable of. Put them over their heads. Yeah. One more. Mm. This picture. Mm. Incredible. Move in on that, guys. Why? You know, I didn't want it. I didn't want him on the cover. I didn't want his name on the cover. I didn't want to be exploitive in any way. You're not. And, and my publisher um, met me at the elevator, <laughs> called an emergency meeting at Simon & Schuster, met me at the elevator with a glass of wine, and said, I want to show you a cover. Have this and then come in. They just wanted to be regular people. They just wanted people. it to be, Walk yeah. the dog here yeah. in Manhattan. Yeah. And what was going on in front of them were about 20 paparazzi walking backwards and <sighs> shooting. And they were just going to get breakfast. Rosemary, thank you for joining us here thank on Public Television. Thank you so television. much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate We're it. I'm proud of you. Thank you. It's a good book. Go out and Thanks. get it.
One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, MagnaCare, Seton Hall University, Investors Bank, NJM, NJ Best, and by ShopRite Supermarkets. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.